Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sam Bays. I'm with the Market Intelligence team here at Open Minds. And today, as part of our weekly executive web forum series, Open Minds Senior Associate Jim Fiorenzo and Vice President Richard Lewis will be discussing using service lines to build your diversification strategy. Richard has extensive experience as a behavioral health administrator, business development specialist, and innovator of new service lines. He has been involved with projects focused on healthcare integration, new service lines, and health plan contract development. Jim Fiorenzo brings over 40 years of business management experience to healthcare uh, to the Open Minds teams. He has a wealth of experience with mergers, acquisitions, partnerships, long-term care systems development, hospital administration, and pharmacy management. Now, before we get started, we have a couple of brief housekeeping reminders. While you are on mute during today's briefings, we are interested in any and all questions that you might have. Please feel free to submit those in the question box that should be on the right-hand side of your screen. And secondly, the recording and slides from today's briefing will be available tomorrow on Open Minds website. Without further ado, Jim and Richard. Thank you, Sam. And uh, we're delighted to have you on this call today. Richard and I hopefully will be able to uh, discuss in some detail uh, the development and, and use of service lines in building a uh, diversification strategy for your organization. Uh, we uh, have discussed uh, extensively the, the opportunity here for uh, looking at your current service lines as well as thinking about new ones uh, in this uh, hopefully post-COVID uh, 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 world that we're living in today. Um, I think that uh, between Richard and I, we have a pretty uh, vast experience in, uh, in, in building and uh, managing uh, different types of service lines. We're hoping that uh, during this discussion um, uh, that you uh, have questions um, that uh, we can uh, discuss with uh, uh, each of us as well as with the group uh, and hopefully get some answers to uh, some of your uh, uh, most pertinent uh, issues that uh, you're dealing with in your particular markets. Uh, Richard, I don't know if you have anything else to say before we open up the uh, slide here. No, it's just it's a pleasure to be here and welcome everybody. You know, I, I think the topic today is really um, timely as, um, you know, um, diversification strategies since, since you know, kind of post-COVID are really a big, a big deal right now for provider organizations across the country. So I'm happy to be a part of this today. Thank you, Richard. Well, Sam, next slide. We talk a little bit about our uh, agenda for today. Um, obviously, we also have our... Uh, Open Minds uh, review, but everybody uh, pretty much has the, that background. So in our agenda, uh, we're hopefully uh, to include the following uh, discussions. Um, how you may build a uh, diversification strategy around your organization using service lines. What is a service line? And hopefully trying to get some definition of that. Uh, analysis of uh, current service line position in your market, not only who um, might be your competition in that world, but also uh, uh, what the, the payer uh, uh, situation is and how they how they look at service lines. Where do you go next uh, with uh, thinking about this and developing service lines? And then also try to wrap up uh, with some discussion around success measurements. Uh, important to uh, to review exactly um, how uh, the implementation has gone and. Uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, returning a significant volume and ROI to uh, to your organization. Next slide, Sam. So, uh, with that, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, building uh, the strategy. We've, uh, in our particular markets, have have felt that um, the assessment process for service lines is very important. Uh, in in most cases. It would take uh, between uh, six months and a year uh, in, in looking at uh, the demographics of your service area, um, the uh, population mixes, the payer mixes, and uh, also the uh, disease-specific issues that, that uh, impact your markets. And uh, it's important for you to do an in-depth analysis when, when looking at this, because if you don't, um, you could be thinking, uh, that maybe an orthopedic service line or uh, an obstetric service line or a heart service line uh, may be imp impactful in your market, uh, but when in fact 
um, you may not have the demographics to support that uh, volume. We also know that uh, um, understanding each market is important. The, the payer issues that affect, the patient population issues that affect uh, can be very important in determining if this is a go or a no-go. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that on the back end of this. Utilization rates uh, for each of our service lines, the analysis of this using your uh, financial support systems, uh, the information you already have uh, from your patient populations uh, will be important in determining if in fact the service line is worth looking at and developing uh, as, as a go forward. The um, uh, support that you get from, from the finance areas and the clinical areas, particularly your physicians, are, are going to be very important in determining if in fact this will be something that you'll be able to continue forward with. Your competition, uh, there may be already uh, competitive service lines in your market and it's important to know who your competition is. If it's a hospital or another um, uh, behavioral health type of unit or a, um, a physician practice group, whoever that might be, um, it's important to know what their uh, uh, intent is uh, through market uh, intelligence, as well as how they compete with you in, in your particular areas. Um, and a significant dive on your payer mix is important as well. The payer mix diversification is going to be uh, extremely uh, important to see if in fact that um, uh, your commercial mix in particular is going to be supportive of uh, developing and supporting uh, uh, service lines in, in your areas. Next slide, Sam. So what we did was we broke out um, the uh, service lines, as, as, as you can see, the five uh, major points here. But I want to make sure that people understand that reorienting, reorienting a, a healthcare organization that focuses on strategy and allocation of resources across the con horizontal continuum of provider entities is kind of the typical uh, uh, definition of a service line. And when you look at this, uh, you, you could say, if you're looking at it from a hospital-based system, you may have um, physician groups um, that are impacted into a particular, car let's say if for cardiac, you have your cardiologists, you have your surgeons, you have your outpatient uh, testing centers like your stress labs, uh, your radiology and imaging services, you may have uh, cardiac rehab. When you take all of those uh, from a, a horizontal perspective, and then you loop them up through uh, one particular uh, strategy around marketing that. Um, that's kind of how we look at it from a horizontal continuum. Um, though you can break off service lines uh, from an inpatient uh, and outpatient perspective, uh, you could take it under a major disease category. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, you could take it under a, uh, a DRG or diagnostic related group uh, strategy. Um, an ICD related strategy, or even a Hicks fix code. Um, all of those are potential um, uh, groupings for service lines. And there are many organizations that have taken different perspectives on this. Most of them have though focused it on the major disease categories. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more in depth on that, but we'll also highlight on some of these other ones as well. Next slide, Sam. So analyzing your current service line position. Um, when you're thinking about service line development, there's no question that you need to look at your reimburse, reimbursement history. You know, how is your organization currently being reimbursed? What is your payer uh, makeup? Uh, where is the margin um, coming from? I mean, in most cases, everybody will say it's from the commercial side, um, but uh, we need to take a heavy, uh, heavy look at and a strong look at uh, Medicare as well as the Medicaid base as well. Um, the margins that are being produced out of a, a current service line, if you factor in it and you're looking to, to revise it or enhance it, obviously important. Um, how are you delivering that service line? Is it primarily inpatient or is it outpatient or combination of both? And uh, um, how the uh, uh, revenues are flowing into each one of those delivery venues. Have you consolidated your service lines in the past or not? Um, have other uh, competitors in your market done the same? Have they taken, for example, 
an obstetric and gynecological service line and broken it off into pieces, or they condensed it even further, as an example. Uh, what kind of fallout or acceptance of new service lines have been in your markets? The, the, it's important to understand do payers and particularly your customer slash patient um, accept service lines? Do they think about your facility as, 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 a, as a premier provider of uh, X service? And that's, that's an important uh, uh, distinction because obviously the patients and the customers are obviously going to be the ones who are going to drive the volume and hopefully the margins and ROI that you're going to need to, uh, to enhance it. Um, I've always felt that leadership structure is probably one of the most important things um, in developing a service line. There's no way that you can sit at the top of an organization and say, I want to be in, in a particular service line and then not think hard about who's going to lead it um, and the structure of that leadership and how it's going to report through the system. Um, usually service lines will have a direct impact on the, the total organization. So if you're in a hospital setting, for example, saying that you want to be in a cardiac service line in particular um, means that, yeah, we're going to promote cardiac services, but it, remember, in fact, that it will the, uh, the delivery of those services will impact every area of the particular hospital, everything from nursing to your imaging services to your, your uh, pharmaceutical services, radiology, what have you. So it's important to understand that when you then structure leadership, what is their control and how much length do they have in regards to control over those particular areas or not. Uh, but the leadership structure, I think, uh, has to be thought through. Uh, in most cases, uh, particularly in hospital settings, uh, leadership structure usually is a, is a combined um, platform with an administrative person along with a clinical, in most, in most cases, a physician um, who can kind of lead or be the go-to for, for that particular service line. So again, we're going to emphasize here that uh, leadership structure is going to be very, very important in regards to um, the success or failure of your particular service line development. Next slide, Sam. Again, um, market support. Um, is your market going to support these services? And again, I have always felt that reaching out to the payers in your particular market uh, is a good first step for determining um, uh, what kind of feedback and, and and uh, following you're going to have for a service line, along with an analysis of your patient population. We've always done an in-depth uh, analysis so with our, our an independent group to go look at uh, potential customers in our market. Uh, for example, if you're looking at a, a uh, uh, orthopedic line, you may be reaching out to people uh, age, uh, uh, you know, 65 and over. Um, who've now started exhibiting uh, needs for new knees, new hips, new shoulders, those kind of things, and uh, seeing what kind of support they would have for uh, supporting your organization if, in fact, you were going to get uh, more uh, advanced in that particular area. Uh, competition analysis, we talked about that a little bit. Um, it's important to understand who your competitors are and what their, in fact, intent is, if, in fact, they're going to continue to move in that direction or, or back off. And maybe it's a good time for you to enter it and take away their business as well, or a good portion of it. Um, those investment dollars that you, in fact, have put aside or can budget for in your particular um, annual spend to uh, uh, support the development and advancement of the service line. Um, obviously, it just, it's not a, um, a purely uh, marketing strategy. Um, it's also going to be an investment strategy for things such as technology and uh, physician um, as well as support staff as well. What kind of expertise you're going to need? Um, you know, is it, is it uh, from an administrative perspective, if you're looking at a, um, a, a seasoned administrator in, uh, in developing that service line, be it behavioral health service line or being a long-term care one, whatever it might be, um, trying to make sure that you understand what is the extent of expertise. Um, in many cases, uh, people sometimes look internally at people who have been in a particular area for uh, for a period of time uh, with some leadership skill sets, uh, or have decided to go outside and bring external expertise into their market uh, to give a whole different perspective on that. But again, that's something you need to spend a little bit of time on as well. 
as well as uh, you know, obviously the the the, uh, the numbers are going to be very very important here. You know, what is a profitability projection, um, and uh, what kind of uh, support is that going to have for the rest of the organization? Uh, we've also felt that uh, service science in many facts in, in many uh, events can actually bring a halo effect to an organization. So if you're advanced and can consider yourself the number one cardiac, orthopedic, neuro type of service line in your market, um, um, it will help your other service lines that may be a little bit weaker um, or you don't have the investment dollars to spend on. Uh, there's no question that uh, in my past experiences as a, as a hospital administrator, uh, we were divested significantly into trauma and felt that the trauma service line was a significant uh, uh, additive effect as well as halo effect to the rest of the organization. Uh, for one reason, uh, it, it usually was on the news every night as, as uh, patients were admitted to the trauma center, uh, you would get uh, significant vi uh, visibility through media attention um, when patients were admitted there, as well as saying if they've got the expertise to do trauma, they must be pretty good at doing X, Y, and Z. So um, it's important to understand that um, so that the trickle-down effect and, and the uh, analysis of your particular service line will be uh, 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 effective. Next slide, Sam. So where do you go next? Um, as we talked about, you know, there are a variety of different ways of approaching service lines. Um, there are the age-related service lines, um, looking at pediatrics, geriatrics is just an, a couple of examples there. Um, there are disease-associated service lines. Um, we, we've given you some examples along the way here. We've talked about orthopedic, cardiac, neuro. There's obviously, obviously cancer service lines. Uh, we've seen some things now. Um, I've seen uh, some new advancements on, on hospital ones looking at um, ophthalmology, knowing that we have um, um, significant aging population that are starting to have vision problems. So vision rehab, those kind of things. So there's a lot of different things that people are starting to look at that are associated with diseases. Uh, there are sleep or the symptom related service lines like sleep and wound care and bariatrics, albeit those are much smaller in, in the extent and focus. But um, I think the approach is very similar in regards to when you go out and say, we've got the best sleep program, we've got the best wound care program or the best bariatrics program, whatever it might be. And then, you know, we've seen a lot uh, with telehealth, obviously, uh, in this uh, in this post-pandemic world, there's been a lot of people looking at telehealth. Um, if if you you know saw where we went prior to COVID, where there was spotty reimbursement for telehealth, uh, we almost got universal reimbursement for telehealth once COVID hit, and uh, the payers realized that uh, for their their uh, patient and uh, customer populations, they'd have to. Um, pay for a service that, in fact, they may have reluctantly in the past had avoided um, just to get their patients' care to avoid uh, significant uh, expense on the back end if, in fact, disease were advancing uh, over a period of time and patients weren't getting primary care um, or specialty support services. So telehealth grew dramatically. We've seen a lot of advance on uh, not only the support services like in BH, but also we saw a lot of physician groups uh, grow into telehealth as well. And uh, uh, I think those are things that we need to think about as, as, as you think about uh, where do you go next with your service line development. Uh, next slide, Sam. So some success measurements. Um, we've already hit, hit on these. You know, how much volume um, have you been able to capture with your, with your service line development? How, how much, what portion of the market share is there? Um, what kind of margins are you producing? Are they better or worse um, than you you had prior to? Have you in you know we didn't talk much about quality, but obviously the payers are going to be uh, very focused on this uh, in respect to does your service line enhance the quality of the services that you're providing in that particular line, and uh, how much uh, positive feedback are you receiving from your patient populations? Uh, what kind of response do you get from your competition, if any? In respect, in respect to the uh, development of and rollout of your service line. Um, again, the patient first thing is, is obviously something that most people will use as a marketing um, a first uh, starter in regards to um, getting out to the patient and customer, uh, stating that, you know, you come here, 
we're going to take care of you. We've got a seamless system, et cetera, et cetera. And then also, uh, how does your physician groups, particularly for those who might be on the outside of the, of the service line, uh, we have started service lines when, in fact, uh, some independent groups that who admitted patients to our hospital got a little bit upset because they weren't kind of included in the leadership structure or even in the development or maintenance structure of that. And that obviously is something you think on the front end there is that there may be physicians and other providers who may be walking away from your organization if, in fact, they're not included or don't feel um, that they're a part of the development or ongoing uh, management of your service line as well. Next slide, Sam. So I know this is a point where uh, uh, we're going to let Sam reach out to, to you to see if, in fact, you have any specific questions. I'm also going to turn it back over to Richard here to see if there's anything he wants to add here before we get to your questions from the audience. And uh, we'll go from there. So, Richard? Yeah, no, uh, thanks, Jim. No, I, I think, I mean, all of these things are important um, things to think about and aspects of, of um, planning and, 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 and analysis for um, developing a service line strategy. And um, I mentioned at the beginning when we started that um, the timing for this couldn't be, couldn't be better. And I think most provider organizations um, because of the the year, the solid year last year of the pandemic and um, the impact that's had on provider organizations to be able to, you know, we, we, we've seen some closures, we've seen downsizing, certain, certain provider organizations have lost, you know, capacity, you know, reduction in, in uh, the ability to see clients on site and face-to-face. Has, has changed the entire market, not only from the provider organization's perspective, but also from the payer perspective, as, as Jim mentioned, um, um, you know, that the, the, the openness of payers to pay for telehealth and virtual consultation for things that normally they weren't reimbursing for. And certainly um, that pivot that we all saw, and when I talk about provider organizations, I'm talking about behavioral health, I'm talking about children's services, IDD, you know, we're drug and alcohol. We're we're, we're talking about all of these different providers, uh, specialty providers. Um, that whole um, embrace and pivot to um, creating or expanding telehealth uh, as a as a key delivery uh, system to kind of stay afloat, you know, during this past year. And now the the, the challenge with um, diversification strategy is how do we uh, maintain, you know, that service line. How do we uh, integrate uh, our virtual consultation capabilities into our traditional on-site services? How do we create these hybrid models that um, I think the payers are starting to look um, look at and say, you know, this telehealth thing worked pretty good. Um, we're hearing from provider organizations that um, uh, the um, uh, the outcomes from telehealth and virtual consultation have been really have been great. So now, how, how do we as providers take that and and bring more of the of the technology uh, based type services into our traditional core service lines? So um, there's a lot to talk about with all of the things that Jim just presented, and and um, and when we hope to touch on all of those, um, you know, as as we continue today's uh, conversation. Thanks, Richard. Um, Sam, do we have any specific questions from our audience at this point in time? Hey, Jim, uh, no specific questions from the audience yet. Friendly reminder to the audience, uh, you can submit any questions on the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. And let me know if oh. you want me to go back to a prior slide. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess maybe, Sam, uh, we could go back to slide where we had listed out these service lines. Uh, I think it was uh, back to uh, – um, go back forward again here. The, uh, <clears throat> now, keep going, Sam. Yeah, stick right there. So the the types of service lines, you know, we talked about this in, in general, and one of the things that um, I've had some uh, recent interest on, and I know that uh, uh, Richard and I uh, just touched on that, uh, is what's happening in the post-pandemic world here in regards to service line development. And the reason this has become much more of an interest is that there were many 
um, hospital systems as well as independent healthcare organizations, BH uh, types of organizations that fell on, on hard times when in fact patients couldn't visit um, their particular providers and receive services um, due to all of the restrictions around managing the COVID patient. But uh, coming out of that on the back end, there's been a lot of organizations now that have said, okay, where do I go next? And what do I add next to my particular um, uh, organization strategies in regards to, you know, where we could in fact add something new or something unique that could then enhance our position in a particular market. Um, interesting enough, um, we've seen this particularly in long-term care with some of the uh, nursing home chains in particular who got hit, hit pretty hard, um, obviously for the various, you know, the, the obvious reasons that patients uh, um, or some of the nursing homes had significant uh, uh, deaths in regards to COVID in their particular facilities. There was a reluctance to put their their loved ones in nursing homes. Um, and then with the, the downturn in patient populations and the lack of surgery, uh, which then ultimately uh, resulted in lack of rehab, uh, nursing homes uh, particularly suffered uh, significant uh, losses. And they now look to maybe reconfigure or realign their, their particular facilities or bed capacities into something else or something different. And where are they looking? Uh, interesting enough, I think uh, a lot of people have started to take, in particular, larger markets uh, because the numbers may not be significant in smaller markets, but things such as COVID rehab, uh, where in fact there are people who are the long haulers are going to need some, some significant um, uh, support for uh, maybe cardiac related issues or what have you. Um, so we've seen, um, you know, the long term care population start to say, okay, what can I do to help enhance uh, my particular margins and also repurpose some of my beds into some things that in fact um, could be uh, uh, particularly interested in, in our markets for, you know, things such as um, maybe dialysis, uh, outpatient dialysis, instead of taking your patients and moving them out to independent facilities, uh, pain management services, uh, those kind of things. So we've seen some enhanced uh, discussion around it. I don't know, Richard, if you've seen anything in your particular market on the West Coast, but uh, that's what we've been seeing here a little bit on the East Coast. Well, if, if we're talking about long-term care, um and, and you hit on the the, the challenges and barriers that long-term care facilities have had due to the pandemic um, we are seeing providers starting to get more creative at looking at how they can provide um, behavioral health services as an example um, to older adults um, things like um, um, you know marketing telehealth services to um, primary care medical groups large medical groups in an attempt to be able to start to work with older adults at the primary care level and, and with, with, with client with the clients and with their families um, so that we can keep them you know healthy both from a medical standpoint as well as a, a mental health standpoint. Um, we're seeing providers looking at providing telehealth directly to clients in long-term care um, as, as kind of an adjunct service to the, the uh, clients in long-term care facilities. Um, for mental health treatment, you know, therapy, um, um, counseling, those types of things. Um, these, these are just some of the new things that we're seeing out there, specific to long-term care, uh, given your example, Jim, um, and in a, in a way that we're seeing providers uh, mm -hmm. leveraging this new, um, this, new um, this new service line. I mean, I think the expansion of telehealth and virtual consultation really is, a, is an entirely new service line for many providers in, in um, not only breaking into some new markets, but to expanding the geographic footprint. I can be a provider here in LA County and I can be providing services to, to, to clients in five surrounding counties with, with telehealth. So um, the, the whole idea of, 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 you know, what is a service line and what, you know, what can you do? Um, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of it has to do with, um, and we encourage clients all the time to, um, you know, assess the needs of your payers in your market. You know, what are they paying for right now? What do they need in terms of service lines from a provider organization like, like, like you folks that are on this, um, you know, on this, on this webinar. 
and 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 start start there in terms of just going directly to payers and asking what service lines do you need and here's what i do here's what i provide here's what i can create for you here are the you know here are the new um, populations we're willing to embrace um, so this whole idea of service line development um, is, is is just it's 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 a huge it's a huge area right now in terms of the the need uh, that that we're seeing out in the you know out in the different markets you know across the country. Yeah, no question. I think that the uh, uh, in these developments too is that there's been a big focus on. I think we talked a little bit about the quality enhancement, hopefully through that, but also the cost effectiveness of delivering it in an organized way. Um, there's no question that um, if you can combine both quality and cost effectiveness in this, that you'll have some attractiveness to your payer markets uh, in particular. Um, so it, it's it's something that um, um, I think most organizations have to give a serious look at to say, if I'm not in service line, um, maybe I should be. If I'm in some, I maybe should re-examine the ones I'm in and determine if in fact those are valuable going forward or if in fact they need to be tweaked to some degree that, that matches more of my market need. So I think that that's in fact something that I think most organizations and most administrations should should take a serious serious look at. The, uh, the biggest issue is, as I was discussing with uh, somebody just recently, was that in developing service lines, it's really getting um, uh, a physician champion who's going to stand up, or physician champions, it's gonna stand up and support that particular development and, and, and try to keep some perpetuity to it because obviously if you're gonna put a significant amount of money on the front end and then not get physician support on the back end to, to help support that, particularly, you know, to your point, um, there's, there's been long-term care facilities that are looking at general psych services in an enhanced way. But then in fact, if they can't find psychiatrists uh, to do the work um, and they go reaching out to a telehealth service that's providing psychiatry services, um, can they continue to provide for a long-term period? Because putting the investment in and then not having the providers in the back end is going to be a significant problem. And that's even, in fact, those cases where maybe the physician isn't as important that, in, say, in general psych, but in fact, um, um, the whole provider um, and care uh, support services that you're going to need to continue your service line in, in, in some, some length of time is going to be really important. So manpower, workforce, all kind of thing is going to be real important. Yeah. And the market and the market's really changed, right? I think uh, some of the big trends that um, that are out there right now are seeing um, payers desire for more integrated models of care, um, the whole the whole person uh, care approach to delivery of services. Um, how, how as providers can we um, start to be able to create, create these these more comprehensive continuums of care in these in a whole person approach, you know, addressing the behavioral health needs of a client, addressing let's say the drug and alcohol needs of a client, and how do we bring primary care into that? Because when we talk about whole person care and we talk about integrated care, um, these are the kinds of things that the payers are looking for. And when I say payers, I'm talking commercial health plans and the managed care Medicaid plans, um, really looking, focusing on that now, especially again, post pandemic. I think that really pushed them to realizing that in order to keep costs down, uh, especially for complex populations, we've really got to wrap around all these services and figure out how, how we can do that. And in your thinking about, you know, service line positioning, what service lines should I, uh, should I develop? Uh, what service lines should I repurpose? I mean, I think these are the, the things that we want to be thinking about, um, you know, from a, from a payer perspective, which really is really have to be taking that in consideration when we're developing these, these different types of approaches. And the, the last uh, big trend is for, um, again, seeing more of our uh, med state Medicaid systems moving more towards managed care, moving more towards contracting again with the managed care Medicaid uh, health plans. So again, it kind of, it's all kind of going back to, you know, what are the health plans looking for? What are the big payers looking for from us in specific markets? And, and how can we meet those needs with our you know, with our um, with our programs and services. Right. Yeah, we've seen a lot of that. Uh, to your point, uh, where the payers uh, come out publicly in regards to 
their uh, uh, you know high cost uh, components. For example, we saw re just recently the United Healthcare talked about uh, not paying for emergency room visits that weren't considered to be emergency. So, uh, in fact, this may lead to organizations like healthcare organizations or physician groups in particular markets to, to, to reconsider uh, thinking about an urgent care strategy where, in fact, you're going to say, well, if, you know, United Healthcare is heavy in our market and they're not going to pay for emergency room services across the board, and in fact, there's going to be more urgent care, more primary care visits. In fact, what is our primary care and urgent care strategy? Uh, another one we just saw in Western Pennsylvania where, where uh, Highmark Blue Cross has been uh, seriously looking at uh, the amount of money they spend on specialty drugs, um, particularly some of those high-cost medications where they use specialty pharmacies to supply uh, these medications across the board and said, we're paying way too much for these particular drugs. We've got to figure out. And what's your strategy? And if you have a pharmacy component or whatever, is that something that becomes an opportunity or something that you've got to reconsider and re, re uh, uh, examine in regards to where you're going in particular, how you address those particular patients. Yeah. No, the whole cost thing is huge uh, for the payers. And if you're able to uh, solve a problem for a payer or deliver a service that's going to reduce cost for them, um, that's huge. And um, we encourage and we're seeing more and more providers um, in the, um, you know, developing of service lines. Um, uh, develop, developing them uh, with the uh, ability to meet things like heat measures, for example. You know, the plans are really concerned about, uh, you know, probably the top five heat measures that we see most, mostly, um, both with managed care Medicaid as well as with any of the commercial and other other health plans out there. Are, you know, provider organizations that can do anything to reduce, um, you know, hospital recidivism. Um, diversion from, from um, psychiatric or acute care hospitals, um, reduction or diversion from emergency department visits, um, timely access to care. If you have a service line or, or an organizational system that um, is, is you know, uh, referral sources, care managers, clients can access your services quickly and easily. You're able to see clients within, you know, seven to 10 days. Um, you know, these are the things that we, you know, your service lines really should be able to deliver. Whether you're a residential treatment provider and you're stepping down clients, you know, reentry back in a community, or you're an outpatient provider, um, addressing these things in your uh, in your treatment goals and tracking these types of measures in your um, uh, for your outcomes, your clinical outcomes and client satisfaction outcomes. Uh, these are the things that the pairs are really looking for right now. Uh, so positioning yourself to be able to solve those problems, those, you know, those high-end cost issues for the plans is will, will be a feather in your cap and, and how your uh, your service lines um, you know, are, are supporting uh, you know, um, you know, um, the reduction of costs in those areas will go a long way in your um, in the success of your service line, especially with your your, your health plan and, and um, managed care contracts. Yeah, you bring up a good point in regards to, uh, you know, one thing we didn't touch on was data analytics here. And data analytics, uh, you know, I felt was very, very important in regards to service line management. Uh, we actually had for our larger service lines would actually have a dedicated one or two person uh, support team um, from the IT world, so to speak, in regards to managing all the data and to your point, the successes and quality measurements that were, were, were going to be needed to uh, to uh, disseminate to our payers um, as, as we went forward. Um, we didn't want to lose out, particularly as, as things branched off as well, even with the large employers in the market. You, you know, we've seen in particular the, the Walmarts of the world and some of these other large employers now direct contracting with uh, provider organizations for specifically their large um you know cost uh types of services be it you know open heart surgery be it total hips knees those kind of things um and uh we want to make sure that if in fact those opportunities present in our market that you know uh we can actually be a uh, a player um, but you're not going to be a player unless you have extremely sensitive analytics to be able to to, to show to them that in fact your outcomes and, and your 
um, patient satisfaction ratings are, are on the high end of things. So uh, um, I think that that's something that we don't want to, uh, um, you know, lessen in regards to our discussion here, because I think that, you know, the support of, uh, of that uh, analytic uh, uh, piece is, is going to be extremely uh, important in regards to the successes or failures of our service line. Yeah, and, and, and I, I totally agree, Jim. I mean, um, uh, even if the contracts you have with payers, whether that be public or private, you know, health plan or, or, or a county or a state are not requiring um, any specific data outcomes reporting, we, we certainly would encourage you to start tracking some of the things that just maybe the major, some of the HEDA scores or other things that would be important to the payers in your market, start tracking on a voluntary basis. Uh, data is gold. Um, if you're able to demonstrate to your uh, payers in your market that the services that you have are reducing costs, improving care, for clients, um, improving uh, client satisfaction, um, any of those things are things that are, um, are are of great value right now, and in really setting your organization up for this next stage, which is the the, the movement that we're seeing across the country, from you know um, you know fee for service to managed care now more into value based reimbursement types of arrangements. Um, so so having that data, tracking that data. Right now may not be mandatory in your market, but it's certainly something you need to start to do and something you're going to be able to use um, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, moving more into these value based kinds of uh, reimbursement arrangements with payers. Yeah, no question. Maybe that's a good time to stop right here for a second here. Sam, uh, do we have any specific questions from the audience? Yeah, here's a question that we have. Uh, what are the implications uh, to, uh, to service lines with health plans continuing their trajectory of backwards integration to own more of the care delivery systems? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, obviously, we're seeing that in, in pretty much most markets today where health plans are protect, buying up um, a lot of the provider pieces. Um, I'm sure it's pretty prevalent in, in California um, and has been uh, uh, starting to see a lot of it on the East Coast as well. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an issue where, in fact, um, you know, it's left pocket, right pocket in regards to the payers. Uh, they're looking at it and seeing if we, can, if we can own the care and then manage the care on the front end, we're not going to spend much off the premium dollar. Um, what we've seen with this, um, just for those who were on the call here, uh, that uh, most integrated delivery and finance systems now are making the majority of their money on the insurance side. Um, they're still struggling with the provider side because of the government uh, payer prop, uh, uh, population expansion. Obviously, we're seeing more Medicare population need to grow into the market, as well as in particular the, in the larger uh, metropolitan areas, we're seeing Medicaid populations grow as well. Um, so therefore, they've got to manage that to some degree. So, um, but on the commercial side, if they own the provider side, they can they can manage the care in a little different way, extend it out further, or deny it altogether, um, and still be in control of the premium dollar. So I don't know what what your opinion is on that, Richard, but I think that that's what I've seen here, where IDFSs are pretty much making a significant uh, entry into these um, uh, provider networks, but also looking at to say I can Im improve my margin on the premium side. Yeah, no, no, I agree 100%. And I think, I think there's still opportunity for, I think there's still tr tremendous opportunity for, especially to provider organizations right now, to work with those systems. Um, take an Optum, for example. Um, you know, Optum is probably one of, the, I think they are now the largest provider of primary care. They bought up all the medical groups everywhere. Um, here in, here I'm in Los Angeles and here in Southern California, they, they, they own all the major medical groups now and are, are just a huge provider of primary care but they're still missing that that primary the that behavioral health piece the social service piece uh, and they're interested more in more and more in um, uh, the behavioral health providers now working with the with these systems and um, bringing in integrated care ideas um, bringing ideas for um, leveraging 
um, you know, social determinants uh, you know, of health now. Um, and so that piece, they haven't bought up yet, um, although we are seeing a lot more, um, a lot more of those types of systems um, in investing in, in telehealth, right, to deliver therapy and, and medication management. Um, but I, I think for specialty organizations, provider organizations, especially for complex populations, we're still going to need the you know, traditional provider organization in a specific market that has all the, the traditional um, you know, outpatient residential case management uh, you know, types of services to uh, complement what these, what these larger systems are doing. And I can speak for California, there's a huge market for that right now. And I think it's, that's the same in, in most markets in the country. Yeah, I would tend to agree, Richard. I think that, the, you know, like you said, the niche player that can, that can really show that they've got a value-based uh, type of service line and can, it can prove that to the payer um even though there might be some competitive there's also there's always room for that one extra or two extra uh provider piece to their to their strategy uh we've not seen them go exclusive um in our markets as well with the idfs um they've they've ditched out to certain um service line providers that that can do it better or can do it more efficiently back to your point earlier that we were talking about making sure that you have the analytics to support that um, and can show and are really willing to work at, 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 a, at a rate that's uh, maybe uh, under or right at near what they're paying their, themselves, so to speak, um, obviously is going to be very important. Yeah. Yeah. Sam, uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? Oh, we sure do. Here's one. How important is it to become a center of excellence? And are some services more likely to help with that process? Um, Richard, you want to start there? Yeah. Um, so, so when when I think of center center of excellence, I think first of all of of um, uh, provider organizations uh, um, starting out as a preferred provider in terms of your position um, in relationship with 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 the payers and um, you know the uh, health plans in particular and especially because we're talking more and more about managed care and value-based reimbursement, uh, provider organizations that are, are providing services and your service lines are, are um, aligned with the payer goals and expectations for you know, clinical outcomes, fiscal outcomes, um, recidivism you know, outcomes, all of these things. Um, having the delivery systems and not only the analytics, but the billing systems, having intake systems that address timely access to care, I mean, just really having all of the, the systems to be uh, a preferred provider, I think is the first step towards um, um, having a, a relationship with a health plan that's gonna do two things. One, get you the best rates and get you, um, you know, the highest volume of referrals that you can get from a, from a payer. And once you have that, I think we're looking at the next step, which is many of the health plans have these center of excellence models where um where you take it to the next level and now you 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 you're starting to get into a world of of um, much higher rates um some you know, kind of exclusivity if you will they're going to send more and more of their patients to you towards anyone else in their network um uh, because you have the data the, the data analytics and the reporting capabilities and you're reporting the outcomes that they're looking for we're hitting those marks um, we're starting to see now more opportunity for, you know, maybe even bundling rates and, 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 you know, creating these case rate, you know, opportunities, almost moving into capitation, which we're not quite there yet on the behavioral health side, but, but moving us there. Um, if you can become a center of excellence, I mean, I, I, it, it really is a, the place you want to be um, and to make you a dominant uh, provider in a specific market. Jim, does that make it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense, Richard. And I and I think that you know my big thing about centers of excellence is are, um, you know, versus saying that you're your center of excellence versus being yeah. a center of excellence are two different things. Yeah. And you know, it comes back to expertise. You can't uh, fool them. My feeling about center of excellence is that if you've got the best surgeon in the market, um, you've got the best. Uh, you know, a cardiologist in the market, um, and you go off and you, you know, can promote that 
and they can back it up from a quality perspective, then it gets the issue of promoting. I always like to, to use the analogy, uh, if, if my, can I go to my family members and recommend them um, to go to that center of excellence um, based on their history, um, as well as their, their current provider state, um, which I always think is, is extremely important in regards to, to making um, the statement that you are a center of excellence. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who kind of label these centers of excellence for purposes of marketing and then can't back it up in the long haul. Um, and as we know, with it, with every negative experience, we're going to hit, you know, 10 people are going to hear about it. Uh, it, it travels small, uh, fast in smaller towns. And I think that's very important to be able to make sure we can back it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sam, do we have uh, any other questions? Yeah, here's another question for us. Um, when it comes to struggling service lines or programs, at what point would you recommend repurposing it versus uh, discontinuing it versus trying to revamp it? And what, are, what would be some tools that you would use to analyze that? You want to take a stab at that, Richard? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I think um, it, when, when I, I, I like the word repurposing. Um, because I think when we're looking at service line uh, development and strategies, I think we have to start with, you know, let's look at the five service lines we have. And I think we do need to take a deep dive into looking at, you know, how are each of these service lines doing from a profit standpoint, from a referral standpoint, from a market need standpoint. Um, and, you know, after looking at all these things, um, you know, uh, how can we repurpose some of these, uh, you know, some of the existing programs? I think the hardest decision for a, a provider to make is if we have five core service lines and we've determined that the fifth one just, you know, it isn't even breaking, e it isn't even breaking, e breaking even. Um, referral volume is 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 shallow. Um, you know, is is making that decision to cut that program and repurpose those resources back into existing programs that are doing better that we can grow we can expand or that actual development of a of a of a new service line um i i think it is is part of that you know and, and you certainly you know there, there's certainly formal tools that you can use to to do those kinds of assessments that are part of you know feasibility analysis and feasibility study and you know part of portfolio management um that, that you can that you can use um that to kind of help you with the, with with um, you know assessing those things and and making those types of decisions. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point. I think uh, the issue of if, particularly if your organization has multiple service lines and you're looking at them at you know what is what is your key measurement tool? You know, in, in many cases it's going to be like you said profitability. It's going to be the quality measurement. It's going to be patient volumes. Um, it's going to be resource need, uh, current and and future. Um, that are going to probably determine in most cases if if you want to continue to go or uh, continue to enhance or then regress. Uh, there's nothing bad about uh, you know uh, breaking apart a service line. Um, doesn't mean you don't still offer the services. It's just your approach to the business model is going to be a little bit different. Uh, in a lot of respects, uh, particularly where you're looking to save money, and to your point, if you've got five and maybe you should only have four, there's going to be some in you know, enhanced revenue or enhanced uh, profitability. If in fact, you cut out a big portion of your investment from a leadership perspective or from from a resource, uh, you know, capital in, uh, intensive uh, process as well, that in, in many cases supports these service lines. So my my opinion about it is there's nothing wrong with, with looking at it um, and repurposing uh, dollars from maybe that particular service line into one of the ones that's really been very successful for you. Yeah. Sam, we have another question. We probably have time yeah. for one more. Yep, one more question. It looks like, um, what are some of the biggest challenges that organizations face in starting a new service line today? <laughs> well, I mean, I think there's a lot of challenges um, right now for um, new service line development, primarily because the market has changed and shifted so much in the last year and a half of of um, of, of the pandemic, and so um, 
you know, going back to, 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 to you know, square one and doing a lot of things that, that Jim mentioned um, on some of the slides that he presented, uh, going back to the basics. We need to go back and look at what, you know, uh, what our competitors are doing, what they're not doing. We need to do a needs assessment of our, of our payers and find out what they need and, and what are the service gaps in, in specific uh, markets or in their uh, provider networks. Um, I, I, you know, this idea of build it and they will come. I, I think we used to use that when I was a psych hospital administrator in the 80s, you know, build it and they would come. I think now we, we, we really need to be much more strategic about um, our thinking about developing a new service line and, and moving away slightly from, from uh, you know, the idea of the mission of our organization, which many nonprofits are, are kind of tethered to and kind of expanding you know, our, our purview uh, from mission and more to, um, you know, uh, you know, what, what are the priorities for our payers? I mean, for me, it always comes down to what, what, what is your county looking for? What is your state looking for? What are the health plans looking for? And, and really doing a good needs assessment and, 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 and um, starting there. So I think the biggest barrier, uh, I, I think for the clients that we work with, oftentimes um, our provider organizations just not having the bandwidth to do that type of assessment and analysis and taking the time to, to meet with the payers, uh, you know, look at competitors in your market um, and, and, though, and kind of putting it all together, um, I think is the biggest barrier. It's the time and the bandwidth, having the resources to do that is, is, um, can be challenging. Yeah, I would agree, Richard. I think that you hit on most of the key, key issues there. My, my opinion about it is, is that, um, you know, my biggest challenge when starting a service line, again, we had talked about the whole issue of uh, physician champion and physician leadership piece uh, to be able to support it and for, for some context of perpetuity. Um, the other thing is uh, uh, looking at your, at, your, at your budgets and making sure that you have the investment dollars and capital dollars that you're going to need uh, to not only start the service, but to, to uh, uh, perpetuate it. For example, if you look at cardiac, um, you know, people don't realize that, you know, uh, if, if in fact you're doing uh, high level cardiology in your facility, we used to have Fort Cath Labs, um, they had to be replaced every five years or particularly, uh, you know, uh, gutted and, 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 and new technology was replacing it to the, to the tune of millions of dollars. Um, so you'd have to be looking at a long range uh, capital support piece for a particular service line. Some of the service lines obviously aren't going to have that high intensity capital and reinvestment in, but again, that's important. Along with leadership, I've, I've also felt that uh, having um, an administrative uh, leader that you can kind of hand off and say, grow that line, uh, know how to do not only the, the clinical development and uh, uh, enhancement that you're going to need to make sure that it addresses all the new challenges in that particular area, but also being able to reach out to uh, the population um, and referral sources in your market to make sure that they understand what you're doing and be able to continue to support it, mm -hmm. um, along with uh, that physician piece are the biggest challenges I've always felt. And that is where um, I think most people kind of miss the boat a little bit, um, that they, they maybe uh, take uh, a person inside their organization that, oh, he'd be or she would be a great service line leader for our orthopedic program or behavioral health program, whatever it might be, um, and not really looking at their, if they're the total package that can be uh, not only a person who can manage and maintain, but also be forward thinking and have some visionary uh, thoughts about uh, how we continue to take this thing to, the, to another level as things advance. And, and the pandemic really kind of uh, proved that out to us that it, in fact, it was going to be uh, something that a lot of people had to think about how do I reinvent myself going forward? Yeah, I mean, when, when you can repurpose managers and directors and folks to be able to take the lead on some of these projects you're talking about, Jim, it's great. Um, uh, but if it's a service line that really is, um, is just really new to the organization, you may have to invest in, a, in, in someone who really knows that service line and can take that lead. Um, and, and again, I just think most organizations just, um, you know, resources are tight. You know, let's face it. And I think, um, um, uh, you know, re repurposing programs, those resources, 
you know, finding a, a champion within the organization if you could do it. If you can't, you may have to make that minor investment if if the new opportunity is worth it to, to bring somebody in who can do that, you know, lead that initiative, whatever that happens to be. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, uh, that wraps up our time here. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Sam and let him uh, do the wrap here. Thank you all for uh, listening in and uh, attending this webinar. We really appreciate it. Richard and I both uh, enjoyed it. And uh, Sam, I will turn it back to you. Yeah, thank, uh, once again, thanks everyone for joining us today for the web forum. Thank you, Richard and Jim, for your time today. I thought the conversation was very engaging and enlightening. So thank you both. I want to remind everyone that the slides and recording will be available tomorrow on the Open Minds website. Also, please consider joining us again next Thursday, where we'll have Ross Robinson discussing how to build a crisis response plan, where he'll be going over the Hill Country case study model. Uh, you can sign up at openminds.com under the events tab listed as executive web forum. Thanks again. Have a great day. Bye-bye. We'll see you now.